Our speaker tonight is Betsy Morris. She's a volunteer at the Nevada Historical Society. And her topic is Before Reno and Sparks, Early Communities in the Truckee Meadows. So before Reno and Sparks, between 1850 and, and 1868, there were communities, little communities like Eastman Mill and Brown's Crossing villages whose names no longer appear on modern maps. So small settlements like these briefly boomed and just as quickly died, and some never really boomed at all. So the talk will look at a few of those communities that today, today can only be found in historical archives. So about Betsy, after a career as a National Weather Service meteorologist, Betsy retired and moved to Reno. She's been a longtime volunteer with the Red Cross. In fact, just returned this weekend from deployment for two weeks in Texas, where she was in charge of 240 unaccompanied minors, boys from 11 to 17, who she said were perfect gentlemen. She's been with the Nevada Historical Society as a volunteer since 2009, where she works in the research library, uh, gives school tours, and sometimes in the store. She likes learning about the history of Nevada and sharing it with others. And tonight, let's hear from Betsy. When I first moved to Reno, the history that I was taught very quickly on was that before there had been Reno, there had been Fuller's Crossing, which became Lakes Crossing, which became Reno. That was about all I knew about Reno. And that later, the railroad moved um, some of its uh, buildings from Wadsworth to form Sparks. So both of these as thumbnails might not be bad, but they certainly miss a lot that was going on in the Truckee Meadows area. Uh, before the creation of Reno and long before the creation of Sparks. Some very interesting communities that shot up and eventually get absorbed by Reno and Sparks and some other places. So let's look at those. First of all, if we're talking about the Truckee Meadows, what exactly are we talking about? And it really depends on what point in history you're at, what you think makes up the Truckee Meadows. Um, the first people who talk about the Truckee Meadows would have been those who are coming across the California Trail as they are heading west out of the Truckee River Canyon. They encounter a wide, long meadow that is to the south of the Truckee Rivers, and this becomes the Truckee Meadows. However, that meadow actually has three different main areas. There is the part that's called the Truckee Meadows, which would run from the Truckee River down to about Rattlesnake Mountain. Um, so it includes the Sparks Industrial Area and goes close to Hidden Valley. But it's, uh, it's watered by Steamboat Creek and the Boynton Slough. But Steamboat Creek also has two more meadows associated with it. Because as you head south, you get to what today we would call South Meadows. Um, but back in the 1860s, it was called the Truckee Valley or Steamboat Valley or sometimes Steamboat and Huff Acres. Um, so that would be the area south of the Huff, Huff Acre Hills down to about Steamboat Springs. And then the third area is as you get into the as you go south on 365, as you're heading toward Washoe Valley, you go through Pleasant Valley, which is the third of the major meadows that are fed by Steamboat Creek. So any of that, those or all of those could be the Truckee Meadows. But today, when we talk about the Truckee Meadows, we're sort of generally talking about Reno and Sparks um, without any clear delineation of what those mean. Um, you know, which part of that would be meadow. I mean, I live 500 feet above. I'm certainly not part of the meadow, and yet I am part of the Truckee Meadows. 
what I found was a book that was written in 1880 that talks about the Truckee Meadows, and it has yet a different idea of what is the Truckee Meadows. And in that book, the Truckee Meadows is sort of a code for a whole general area. So to the south of the Truckee Meadows is Washoe Valley. To the north of the Truckee Valley, uh, the Truckee Meadows is Lemons Valley. Of course, today we call it Lemon Valley, but it was Lemons Valley in 1880. Um, to the west of the Truckee Meadows, you would have the Sierra above about 6,000 feet. And to the east, you would have the Virginia Range. So everything in there uh, that's in that wide area becomes the Truckee Meadows. So in that kind of reckoning, you can include Verdi and Galena and Pleasant Valley and a lot of other places as part of the Truckee Meadows. And that's the definition that I'll use simply because it allows me to talk about a few more communities than I could if I used a more strict definition of what the Truckee Meadows may be. The Truckee Meadows has had people living in it for thousands of years. Um, the Washoe tribe has been here for hundreds and for them, the Truckee Meadows was a place to live in the winter. And of course, much of that tribe would go into the Lake Tahoe Basin during the summer. And so for quite a few years after the coming of the Euro-Americans, there was some peace between the Washoe tribe and the Euro-Americans because they weren't in the Truckee Meadows area at the same time. It took a long time after Euro-Americans had come into the Truckee Meadows before we saw year-round residents of the Euro-Americans there. And for those of you who are wondering, I spelled Washo, W-A-S-H-O. What's the difference between that and Washo spelled with an E? Um, it's probably preference. The reason I used Washo without an E is because I just recently saw some pamphlets that were published by the tribe and they used it without the E. So I thought I'll use what they say. It's the California trail through Nevada that brings most people into the Truckee Meadows. Before that, of course, we have the Native Americans who are already living here. And before that, there had been fur trappers in the uh, late 1820s and 1830s, but the fur trappers are gone by the time that the California Trail is developed. In 1844, we have the main branch of the California Trail. Um, you can see it in blue on this chart. And in 1844, what is developed is the Truckee River route, which is the first good way to get across the Sierra. And of course, it goes right through the Truckee Meadows. Um, for the next several years, you have several hundred wagons that pass on the California Trail through the Truckee Meadows. And over time, there are two other additional routes that are developed, neither of which go through the Truckee Meadows. And those would be the Carson Trail, which is the best trail, and the Applegate Lassen Trail, which is really a far worse trail but it doesn't have the baggage that the Truckee River route gets because it doesn't have a Donner Party that gets trapped overnight with rumors of cannibalism. So by the time that the gold rush happens in 1849, when you go from having hundreds of people to tens of thousands of people trying to go across the California Trail into California, what you find is that there are more people than two trails can handle. So all three trails are used, but of the three, the Truckee River route is probably the least used simply because people are spooked about the Donner Party that went through several years before. There are still people who are using it, but it doesn't get the traffic that the Carson route and the Applegate Lassen Trail have. Um, and so we don't see quite the volume going through the Truckee Meadows. That changes none of the three trails can really handle the kind of traffic that's coming over. So in 1850, the Hennis Pass route is developed. This is a toll road. It's really meant for freight and it goes through the Truckee Meadows. And then in 1851, we have the Beckworth Trail, which of all of the trails, it is the easiest. Now that's not to say it was easy. None of these trails is easy but it is the easiest to get over. It's the lowest pass 
and the gentlest grades as you are ascending from the east. It's a longer trail, but a better trail. And that too goes through the Truckee Meadows. So by 1851, what you've seen is a consolidation of traffic, mostly coming through the Truckee Meadows, although the other trails are still used, but we're starting to see a lot more traffic coming through the Truckee Meadows. In 1852, the first trading post is developed in the Truckee Meadows. And this is Jameson's and it is very close to where the uh, California Trail exits out of the Truckee River Canyon. And then there is another trading post in 1853, which is a little farther west of Jameson's, it would, and that may or may not have been owned by Jameson. The records are insufficient to know exactly um, where this trading post was or whether it was Jameson's having moved. Um, by 1854, we have a trading post that's developed up at Crystal Peak, as well as uh, trading posts that are right in the Truckee Meadows. And this is the year that John Owens and Edward Ng open a trading post. Again, records aren't quite clear. Either they opened their trading post where Jameson's had been, or they opened one that was very close to where Jameson's was. It's, it's not quite clear. But anyways, you now have several trading posts that can be used for travelers coming through the Truckee Meadows. 1854 is when we also see speculators coming in. These are not people who want to live in the Truckee Meadows, but they are people who think that there may be some potential here. Now, most of them aren't bothering to go through the legal process of getting land, or even if they do go through that process, the land that they say they have is probably a lot more than they actually laid claim to. But in 1854, speculators start coming in and pretty soon all of the arable land in the Truckee Meadows, um, someone claims to own. This shot of the Truckee Meadows is actually a little bit later than our time period. I believe it was taken in 1872. It's a promotional shot by the Central Pacific Railroad. But what I wanted to show you is what the Truckee Meadows looks like in some of the very earliest pictures. This may be one of the earliest pictures we have of the Truckee Meadows. As you can see, uh, the shot is taken from what today is Sparks and looking into the background beyond where the train is, we're in the, the Sparks industrial area. The first water that you can see would be the Truckee River. And then the water behind that would be from Steamboat Creek. And what you can see is that along the waterways, there are some trees, but they aren't very big. We're talking about scrubby trees. Um, in the meadows themselves, there is good tall grass, but the rest of the area, we're talking about sagebrush and rocks. It is not a particularly appealing place. However, we do have these wonderful meadows. One trader who went west on the California Trail recalls traveling through the Truckee Meadows in 1853. And here's what he wrote. In the month of August, 1853, our train, consisting of nine wagons, two or 300 head of horses and mules, and 750 head of cattle were all driven and managed by 45 men. We moved up to the Truckee Meadows, about five miles below the present town of Reno. Such a grand sight for hungry cattle and horses. Thousands of acres of blue joint grass laid around us. Our herds reveled in it for several days and yet they could make no impression upon it. The first people, uh, the first Euro-Americans to live in the Truckee Meadows uh, year round um, would have been members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Orson Hyde was a judge in Carson City. And in 1855, he founded Franktown. He was then asked by Brigham Young to develop a second place where Mormons could go to live in the western part of what was then Utah Territory. And so Orson Hyde was looking at two places in particular. He was looking at the Truckee Meadows as a possibility and Honey Lake. 
pretty quickly, Hyde decided that the place to be was the Truckee Meadows. And he identified it as being a good potential spot both for ranching and for fisheries. His problem was that all of the good farmland already was claimed by someone else. So Hyde, being pretty savvy, went to the Truckee Meadows and let it be known at the gathering places that he was going to be going back to Salt Lake and would be bringing 500 people to Honey Lake. Upon hearing that, the speculators who had grabbed up all the land in the Truckee Meadows immediately left. They rushed up to Honey Lake so that they could lay new claims and then make money off the what they supposed would be the incoming Mormons. As soon as they left, Orson Hyde went and gathered up his 500 people and brought them into the Truckee Meadows, which was now nearly vacant. The Mormons settled in Pleasant Valley and what today would be the South Meadows part of the Truckee Meadows. Because there were so many polygamous families in this group, including plural lot, wives, Pleasant Valley became nicknamed Plurality Valley. So that's in 1856. In 1857, we have Peleg and Joshua Brown coming to the uh, Truckee Meadows. Joshua soon leaves, he goes back east, but Peleg stays. And so he is in the Truckee Meadows when Brigham Young sends out a call for all faithful Mormons to come back to Salt Lake City. He is very worried about war with the United States. Remember, this is all territory at the time and Nevada's part of the Utah Territory. Brigham Young is afraid that there may be a war and he wants his people with him. And so all of the Mormon faithful who had come in the year before sell what they can, abandon the rest, and go back to Salt Lake City. Peleg says he and two other men are the only Euro-Americans who spend the winter of 1857-1858 in the Truckee Meadows. Peleg writes a lot of letters while he's there. Fortunately, it's easy to get to Carson. And in one of the letters, he brags that once every two weeks, letters are sent from Carson back to the States. So he writes a lot of letters. Um, over the winter, he praises the wonderful weather, uh, not a lot of snow. He claims there's no wind, which is a little hard to understand, um, but talks about how great the weather is. He doesn't even need to feed his cattle. They can do fine on their own. Um, in another letter, he talks about the fact that the Native Americans who live there are very friendly. He says every day, some of them come to visit him and they bring him deer meat, has good relationships with them. He was not a lover of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and quite often makes snide remarks about them. In the summer of 1858, he writes back that he has purchased a ranch, one square mile, and he bought it for 12 heifers. And then he also has to pay $50 to get a plow made. Um, this is his ranch house, which was built in 1864. Today, we know it as the DeMonte Ranch House, but it, it was built by Peleg Brown and the DeMonte Ranch originally was his ranch. Around Brown's ranch, there is a small community that develops that's called Brown's. Uh, Brown is reputed to have been the first person to try to grow met vegetables in the Truckee Meadows. He also may have been the first one to have had water disputes. There's quite a court case that takes place in 1865, which he wins and he manages to get other people to stop using the water from Brown's Creek. Brown is so successful as a rancher that um, when the B&T Railroad is established, they do make a stop at Brown's um, because 
there's almost always something that they can take up to Virginia City from Browns. In 1857, John Stone and Charles Gates build an inn, which is called the Farmer's Inn. They also build a trading post and a ferry on the north side of the Truckee. It's near where uh, South McCarran crosses the Truckee in Sparks today. And John Stone and Charles Gates appear to have uh, been working with Ng, who had been one of the uh, trading post owners earlier on. So um, he seems to have gone into business with Stone and Gates, although his name doesn't appear on things the way Stone and Gates do. The beauty of the Stone and Gates crossing is that this is where immigrants will go north to get onto the Beckworth Trail. So it is a good place for people to rest before they uh, go into the last part of their journey over the Sierra. It also is located where you might go south to get on to some of the other trails. So it, it's, it's really a crossroads. And in a side note, Stone of Stone and Gates is knowledgeable to some extent about geology. And when he hears that people up in Virginia City have found gold, but they also have found some muck, this grayish mud that's messing up their pans, he's the one who thinks maybe there's more to it, goes up to Virginia City, gets some samples, takes them to Sacramento, and becomes the first person to realize, uh, or at least the first person who realizes and lives to tell it, that there is a lot of silver up in Virginia City. Surprisingly, he does not then go up to Virginia City and stake a claim, but he's, is, he's the one who brings back the news that Virginia City, what will become Virginia City is rich in silver. So because of the crossing and the inn, we have a village that grows north of Stone and Gates Crossing. In 1858, it's written that ranchers arrived in, in earnest mostly due to the fact that this is part of the Truckee Meadows. There's a lot of water, irrigation is easy. Later, a year later, when Fuller announces a plan to build a bridge across the Truckee, Stone and Gates and Ng realize that they need to do something similar. So they build a bridge that's going to be a free bridge across the Truckee where their ferry had been. Theirs is built in 1860. Even though the bridge that Fuller builds connects to an extension of the Virginia Road, so it's a shorter route to get from the California Trail down to Virginia City, many Teamsters prefer to go over the bridge that, uh, at Stone and Gates, which hooks to what's called the Old Road, which would be the uh, trail going basically along where McCarran is today, going down the east side of the Truckee Meadows and connecting farther south to the uh, road to Virginia City because the road surface is better for their teams. It was written that Stone and Gates ruled unchallenged in the Meadows' northern half before 1868. By 1864, Stone and Gates had a hotel, several stores, a blacksmith shop, saloons, and other um, businesses. The Glendale Hotel was the rendezvous, and here men assembled, and the old hotel resounded with the jolly gatherings of the good old times. Stone and Gates was considered to be a little bit awkward, so in 1866, the people decided to rename the town and they named it after the hotel, which was the Glendale, two words. Very quickly, it became shortened to Glendale, one word. In 1868, Glendale was one of three sites that was considered by the Central Pacific Railroad to become its east side of the Sierra hub. Of course, the other two would have been what by now is Lakes Crossing, and Crystal Peak. Unfortunately for Glendale, when representatives of the railroad came to actually see what was there, there had just been a flood. And so Glendale dropped out of contention to become the East Side Sierra hub. Instead, land near Lakes Crossing was selected 
And of course, this leads to the creation of Reno in 1868, within months of Reno being established, all of the businesses in Glendale had moved to Reno. So basically the town died. Now, because the land was so rich, the farms that have been established near there remained. So there are still some people living in the Glendale area, but it no longer is a recognized community. In fact, it's said that the town vanished from sight. This is the Alt House in Glendale uh, or at Glendale. Even though the town of Glendale had ceased to exist, the ranches are still there. This is George Alt's home. Wren's History of Nevada says that Alt settled in Glendale in 1854. Now this doesn't seem likely because in 1854, no one was living year round in the Truckee Meadows, although it's possible that he staked a claim in 1854. What is uh, sure, is that he was living in Glendale in 1861 because there's business and tax records that show him there. Um, he had a ranch in the store in Glendale. He served as a Nevada uh, legislator from 1885 to 1889, and he also was a Washoe County commissioner. And he introduced Durham cattle to the state. So we have Glendale, which initially grew in part because it was well irrigated, which brought in ranchers, but also grew because it was a crossroads. Um, you can get to the Hennis Pass Road and to the Beckworth Trail, as well as the older Truckee River Trail by going through Glendale. So what about where other roads converge? And especially after 1859, after you have the rush to Washoe, to get to Virginia City, to get rich on the silver and gold that are up on that mountain. Look at the, the main roads that we have in the south part of the Truckee Meadows. In blue, you have um, the road that will lead you up to uh, some of the lumber areas that are supplying the timber that's needed for the mines. Moving south, you have uh, the road that goes to Carson City. And with the influx of people, suddenly getting to Carson City becomes more important because it is the legislative center of this, the territory. And then you also have the road, the Virginia road, the road that goes to Virginia City. And all three of these roads meet um, down in the south part of the Truckee Meadows. So what would happen if you happen to have something established right there? Would it be like Glendale? And it turns out there is a place that was right there. There was Huffaker. Um, the land south of the Huffaker Hills initially had been settled by the Mormons, but of course they've left in, they left in 1857. The next year, two men from Salt Lake City Granville Huffaker and Lou Drexler, who had owned a store in Salt Lake, drove 500 head of cattle into the Truckee Meadows. They traded cattle, built a store, and raised bumper crops of alfalfa. And their store was large, larger than the store in Glendale. And very quickly, the place where they've set up shop grows into a busy trading and ranching post, and it also develops a sizable community around it, which is called Huffakers. Located on main crossroads throughout the 1860s, Huffakers was a valley metropolis, larger than Glendale and much larger than Lakes Crossing. In 1860, Huffakers got a Pioneer Express office, which would have been a stage stop. For the next decade, it was the primary stage station in Washoe County. The rush to Washoe resulted in Huffakers getting a post office, hotels, saloons, express yards, and livery stables. It was known as a gathering place for bachelor ranchers to come and give rein to their natures with dances, horse racers, and arguments about land, basically squabbling about who owned what. In some of the reminiscences of George Peckham, who was one of the early pioneers in the Truckee Meadows, he said, Glendale was the literary and social metropolis of Truckee Meadows and Steamboat Valley during 1866 and 1867. But of course, Huffakers was an ambitious rival. 
there were two stores in Glendale and one at Huffaker's. The first school in the um, Steamboat Valley would have been the Huffaker School in 1868. It is not the first school in the Truckee Meadows. That honor goes to Galena, and we'll talk about Galena a little bit later. But the first school in the Truckee Meadows was the Galena School in 1863. But the Huffaker school, school was on Virginia Street. Today it is in Bartley Park. Um, uh, Huffakers also had the first cemetery in the Truckee Meadows. Ty Cobb wrote, almost immediately, Huffaker's ranch became a center of activity. What would become Reno was a sparse settlement of a few shacks. And here we have Huffaker's home, which still is on South Virginia Street. Of course, it's become a firearms store. His 600 acre ranch eventually would become part of the Holcomb Ranch. Huffaker um, was not married when he came to Nevada, but he did marry a woman he met in, in the Truckee Meadows. The marriage didn't last long. They were divorced and she moved somewhere else, somewhere out of Nevada. But Huffaker does end up with a daughter. He is well liked in the area. He, um, his ranch is famous for its water. Um, lots of people talk about how sweet the water was at Huffacres, the best water that they'd had um, coming across this awful California trail. And apparently it was fairly generous. One day, and I believe it must have been getting close to the fall, a family stops. They're on their way to California. Their daughter is very ill. They don't think she can make the difficult ride journey up over the, the mountains. And they ask Huffaker if he will take care of her. And they promise they'll come back in the spring. He agrees. The family never returns. So he ends up adopting the girl and raising her. When she's 18, she marries uh, a local boy. Unfortunately, at the age of 19, she dies in childbirth as does her child. I, in um, 1859, George Stout built a log bridge across the Truckee near where Mayberry Road crosses the Truckee River. In 1860, he also built a hotel. In 1861, John Hunter set up a station across the river from Stout. It has a water-powered mill for cutting lumber and this becomes known as Hunter's Crossing, and later it becomes known as Mayberry's Crossing. Galena was developed as a mining property in 1860. Um, silver was discovered in the eastern foothills of the Sierra Nevada. It was written that it was the first honest to gosh mining camp in the Truckee Meadows. The story is that Indian Jim and several other Paiutes found lead ore and traces of silver west of Pleasant Valley on Galena Hill. 200 people rushed to this new site. It had one of the earliest quartz mills and smelters on the side of the Sierra. Now it soon became apparent that it might not be the best possible place for mining. It turned out that um, the gold had a heavy mixture of lead sulfide, which is also called Galena. And the techniques that were available at the time were not good enough to do a good job of extracting the gold from the, lead, from the lead. And it just wasn't going to be profitable. However, the equipment they had could be used to um, mill the ore that was coming from uh, the Comstock load. So they were still able to do a type of mining, but it turned out that the real riches in Galena were in the logs that were there. So the entire town moved itself a half mile away to get closer to the Virginia Road and uh, mining became its strong suit. In very short or order, there were 11 sawmills operating in Galena. It was said that the town's streets during the height of commercial activity were crowded with grog shops 
It overflowed with charcoal burners, wood choppers, timbermen, millers, miners, bullwhackers, and teamsters. By 1864, it was the largest um, development in the Truckee Meadows with 250 people. However, there was a bad fire in 1865, the town rebuilt. There was a second disastrous fire in 1867. By that time, there was competition for mill work by the mills that were along the Carson River and the town basically was abandoned. So it just dies after the fire of 1867. In 1861, a hamlet grew up next to George Eastman's sawmill, which was south of the Truckee near today's Grand Sierra Resort. It was a holding place until the river would rise enough. What they would do is they would send logs from Crystal Peak down the Truckee River when it was running high, and then they would be put into this holding area for the Eastman Mill. So this was not a year round mill. It only operated when uh, it was springtime and the waters ran high or after heavy thunderstorms, which would temporarily raise the river. Mill Street is the lane that led from the Eastman Ranch by the Eastman Mill to Reno. There was another mill of interest and that was Auburn. This mill was built by an English company about a mile north of the future town site of Reno. A 20 stamp mill was erected here for crushing quartz. A cluster of home for mill workers was built around the mill and the village was called Auburn. However, the birth of Reno completely overwhelmed Auburn and it died in its infancy, became absorbed into Reno. Although irrigation ditches were built along the Truckee in the 1860s, in the 1850s, excuse me. These were um, small affairs, usually watering a few ranches, not going very far. We really see the big work in establishing ditches in 1864. And the ditches are very important for the growth of this area. I mean, when you look at this picture, you can see that except for a few bushes immediately next to the water, you don't have much. This is rocky, soil and um, sagebrush, it is not particularly tempting. When you look at where the water was in 1864, here's what was written. Within three miles to the south of today's downtown Reno, land was considered worthless, having neither natural gas, grass nor water for irrigation. So we're talking about Midtown and Southwest Reno were considered worthless until the ditches came. So in 1864, we see the first large scale ditch projects with um, the ditch that Cochrane and Longley created, which was seven miles long. And of course that really starts a, um, a almost a tidal wave of ditches, lots of ditches bringing water to lots of areas that had never seen much water before. 1864 also saw Irvin Bell come to the Steamboat Valley. And he's given credit as being the first to demonstrate that alfalfa and shade trees could be grown in the sagebrush land. Now, in my research, I found three different people who were credited with bringing alfalfa here. So I don't know whether Irvin was the first or not, but he certainly was one of the early people to do it. It was said that his first attempt at setting out trees and sowing alfalfa was looked upon as a crazy scheme, but the beautiful green fields upon his ranch and the fine cottonwood groves are the only proof necessary that his judgment was sound. Now moving a little farther afield into things that today we don't think of as being the Truckee Meadows, but that in 1880 were included in the definition of what the Truckee Meadows would be. Um, so we're talking about Crystal Peak, O'Neill's Crossing and Verdi. O'Neill's Crossing, also known as O'Neill's Station was a stage stop and it was the location of a bridge across the Truckee. The bridge was built in 1860 and was near today's Bridge Street in Verdi. It was a small community that developed near the crossing. Later, all of this is absorbed into Verdi. Then there's Crystal Peak. Close to O'Neill's Crossing was Crystal, the Crystal Peak Trading Post that had been founded in 1854. 
In 1864, a town was laid out by the Crystal Peak Company. The company already owned mining and lumber interests west of the town. While both coal and gold were found near the site, they proved to be useless, but the lumber was valuable. Sawmills were built, which fed the mines and the railroad in the thriving town of 300 people that developed at Crystal Peak. In 1868, when the Central Pacific is looking for its seaside Sierra hub, it's rejected Glendale, but Crystal Peak was one of the two other sites that they were considering. When word gets out that Crystal Peak might be one of the sites, the town swells to 1,500 people, making it at the time the largest place in the Truckee Meadows. However, when the train tracks were built, they were two miles away. And the train stopped at a town that it created called Verdi. Crystal Peak went into rapid decline. And of course, today it's considered part of Verdi. Uh, there was some small time process Expecting that it occurred on Peavine Mountain. Basically, they've been mining Peavine Mountain for 160 years. In 1863, the town of Peavine was laid out on Peavine Mountain. It's nine miles from where Reno will be. It has copper, silver, and gold, but using the techniques they had at the time, it was difficult to reduce the ore. So it became another unsuccessful mining site. But in 1865, more riches were found and there has been such a revolution in mining just in the last two years between 1863 and 1865 that now it is economically feasible to obtain the ore. So 150 people suddenly are in the area and they settle into what they call Po City. So there's a number of different communities, different names, Peavine, Po City, Poville, Podunk, um, all places on Peavine Mountain, just depending on what year it is and where exactly some of the ore has been found. Of course, there'll be several subsequent mining boons and busts on Peavine. So those are some of the early places in the Truckee Meadows. Here's some census data. In 1860, of course, the Truckee Meadows is part of the Utah Territory. And th that year, the census, as will be the case for the next two censuses that are taken, non-whites are not included in the census. So the census says that there are 22 dwellings and 105 people living in the Truckee Meadows. In 1862, at which point the Truckee Meadows is part of the newly formed Nevada Territory, we are up to over 400 people being in the Truckee Meadows. So we've seen a 400% increase in population um, just in two years. And at that time, Galena is the largest community. Steamboat Huffacres is about a third of the size of Galena. Glendale uh, comes next. And O'Neill's Crossing is the only other site with any significant population. Peavine, Stout's Crossing, and Fuller's Crossing are all also rands. Then we get to 1870, and nothing is the same. Galena, that had been the largest place in 1862, is almost gone. Steamboat and Huffacres um, has grown. And they're far enough away from Reno that they'll continue, it will continue to grow. And in fact, you'll see it on maps even in the 1940s um, that Huffacres is still shown as an area because Reno hasn't grown enough to completely absorb it. Glendale, what you can't see in the two census figures between 1862 and 1870 is Glendale grew to a community of almost 300 people by 1865, but with the formation of Reno, Glendale collapses. O'Neill's Crossing and Verdi, um, sort of constant. Of course, Fuller's Crossing that became Lakes Crossing and then becomes part of Reno is the wonder kid of the neighborhood. Auburn Mill has grown some. Crystal Peak, which you can't see again from these figures, 
is the 1,500 people who were briefly there in 1868. But what you can see is the, this rapid increase in population over the course of just 10 years. Thank you for being with me today. The photos are mostly courtesy of the Nevada Historical Society, and I'm particularly grateful to Sherry Hayes Zorn for all of the time that she spent with me helping me find photographs because you know, one of the problems with talking about this time is that there are very few uh, photographs that are of the period. And so I thank you for attending and I'm going to turn this back to Carol for questions. Thank you, Betsy. I found that really interesting. You always add new things whenever <laughs> you give this presentation. So there's a comment from William Nay, and he says, my great grandfather Winslow P. Nay and his close friend Enoch Morrill knew the Holcombs and the Huffakers, or knew, maybe he's talking about a place, knew Holcomb, Holcombs and Huffaker. They were responsible for the digging of the last chance ditch from Mayberry's Crossing to near the Holcomb Ranch. If Huffaker had this sweet water, where, why did they have it? Was it a, was it a ditch or was it one of the creeks? It would have been one of the, the creeks. Um, okay. Yeah, when they were raving about the water at Huff Acres, it was before any of the, the real ditch digging. Okay. Early on, you said that the fur trapping, trapping, fur trappers were there in 1820 and 1830. Now, now I know the answer to the question, but why, why did it stop then? Um, the main reason that the fur trapping stopped was because the trappers were here for beaver. And the reason beaver were being trapped was that was the style for men's hats. It was the style for men's hats in the United States, in Europe, and in Asia. And then suddenly, silk hats became all the rage. And the market disappeared. Did you actually talk about the Galena schoolhouse or show a picture of it? Um, I don't have a picture of it. Oh. And yeah, I probably um, didn't, wasn't looking at my notes when I talked about Galena, um, but they, they had a schoolhouse in 1863. So it was the first house in the sort of expanded definition mm -hmm. of the Truckee Meadows. There's a question from about where Crystal Peak is in relation to Verdi. If you go up to Verdi, um, there actually is a Crystal Peak Park where you can um, see the, the mill pond that would have been used by one of the sawmills up there. And that would be where Crystal Peak was. It's, um, when you're in Verdi, it's sort of what would be west and north Verdi. There's a comment that Thank you for the ditches. Someone has lived here for 11 years and, and want, wanted to know uh, where they came from. I think the Chinese were responsible for building a lot of them. They were hired to build many of them, yes. Oh. And like the steamboat ditch is 32 miles long, uh, comes from the Truckee along the... Uh, west side of Reno, west side of the Truckee Meadows, all the way down to meet Steamboat Creek. Yeah, it's really amazing where, how long those ditches are. And, and uh, there must have been some marvelous engineers designing yeah. some of these because yeah. we're moving through mountains. <laughs> Is there a map with all of the ditches shown? I'm sure that if you went to the Historical Society, you could look at all kinds of maps <laughs> yes. that, that are about the dishes. Yeah. There are, there. Are, I know at the Historical Society, there are boxes and boxes and boxes of things about the ditches. Um, and there are many, many talks about the ditches uh, with people who know a lot more about them than I do. This is William Day, Nay, who maybe could give us a talk on ditches. He's saying that the last chance ditch is 17 miles long and it was built by Chinese labor. This is from Mark Richardson. 
The Galena School was built of wood from their home in Virginia City by the Callahan family in 1908, was upgraded to stone in 1940, and it was used until 1959. And William Nay says, the last chance ditch has a section that goes through Bartley Ranch Regional Park. And Mark also, Mark Richards is coming back and says, the school is next to Callahan Park. Well, just thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> I love having an opportunity to talk about some of the things that I've learned. We appreciate all, all of the research you've done to, to do this. Well, I'm, we're getting lots of thank yous, Betsy. So <laughs> not, not, not necessarily questions, but people appreciate the work you've done and the presentation. <laughs>